Have you ever been in church where the end was the beginning? We're going to start at the end, and then we're going to see if we can validate and prove what we said and professed at the beginning. One of the greatest verses in the Bible, and there are many of them, is Romans chapter 8, verse 31. And it says, in light of all this, what do you have to say? If God be for us, who can be against us? I wonder as I say that, if God be for us, the congregation would answer, who can be against us? Okay, if God is for us, who can be against us? Let's try that again, everybody. If God is for us, and then I'm going to turn and point at the choir, and they'll answer, nobody. nobody. All right. If God be for us, nobody. that's a gigantic assumption, isn't it? That's a strong profession of faith. If God be for us, Nobody? Do you really believe that? Do you know, not just by faith or assumption, or because you've always heard it, do you know that is absolutely positively true, and that's what we're going to talk about? The validity of that tremendous, overwhelming statement if God can be for as far as who in the world can be against us, nobody, nothing. That's an overwhelming thing, an overwhelming thing. See, a lot of people say, I'm a Christian because, boy, it's exciting. Or I, I'm a Christian because I love to go to church and, and we interact there and we intermingle there and we get involved. With one another. I, I like that. I'm a Christian because I know Jesus taught the highest principles by which mankind can live. That's why I'm a Christian. Let me tell you something. All that is fine, but we don't become a Christian by feeling. We may accept Christ in an emotional moment, feeling, need, et cetera, et cetera, but that's not enough. Feeling has to be transferred into fact into truth. And we are a Christian because Jesus, what he said about himself is absolutely true. We are a Christian because the facts of history, that salvation history we've talked about is absolutely true. So we don't just float around in the honosphere. We also have feeling, but our feeling is based on absolute fact and absolute truth. That's the foundation of valid, alive, functioning, experiential Christianity based on truth. Now, we looked at another famous verse in the Bible. Romans 8, 28, and we love that verse. Been around church for a while, gone through some bottom experiences. We love to say, for we know that all things work together for good to those who love the Lord and those who are the called according to his purpose. Now, that's a fabulous claim, a fabulous promise we can step into and believe and profess, and it changes everything, but we need to understand it fully. For all things, we need to understand as Christians, we go through all things, the good, the bad, and the ugly. How many people I know are supposedly, foolishly, stupidly, misinformingly, if that's a word, mad at God because God took a child, because they have a lifetime health problem, because they have 
stirred up so many problems and they have so many enemies and we go on and on and on and on. We have to understand that all things happen to all people and Christians are not excluded. We're part of all things, why? We live in a fallen, broken world where evil is rampant. So we are caught up in all of this. It's good to say, boys, Christians, we don't have tough times. Boy, as a Christian, I'll always get a promotion. I won't lose my job. A lot of people had the idea because we're Christian, we're bulletproof and independent from all things that are breaking out in a fallen, broken world. That's not true. All of us could stand up and say, in my life, this happened. In my life, this did not happen. So we're caught up in all things. All things. Now, I will put a little parentheses over here. If we live the Christian life genuinely in obedience, in practice, prayer, worship, we run everything by our lives through Jesus Christ who runs our life, who is our Lord and Savior. We are exempt from a lot of stuff that befalls the world that does not accept and know Jesus. I give you that, that's absolutely true. But the same token, we're not exempt from the whole suffering agenda of the world. That we have to understand. So all things, we're involved in all things, Christians, work together for good, that's what we have that the world does not have. Because God in his formula of life for those who are his sons and daughters, in all these things, the good, the bad, the ugly, the ups and the downs, they are working together by a divine, divine recipe, a divine formula that God has for all of his children. That's the distinctiveness. All things work together for good, to those who love God and those who are the called according to his purpose. We see this lived out in many situations. A lot of us could stand and say, man, this was the worst thing that ever happened, but that was in a microcosm. That was micro, in the macro of life, in the macro of eternity. All things work together for good to those who love God and those who are the called according to his purpose. Many illustrations of the Bible. One I love is Lazarus. What a story. Lazarus died, close friend of Jesus. Jesus went there four days after he had died. He'd received the message from Martha that come quickly, Lazarus is sick. And when Jesus gets there, what does Martha say? If you had been here, he would not have died. Put Jesus on a guilt trip, right? Yeah. Read it right, accurately. If you'd not been here, then he wouldn't have died. And Jesus, if you read the scripture at that moment, he was angry. Oh, yeah. And he was tearful. He was angry and he was tearful. And Jesus then, you would have think he would have said, just hold on, gang. You think this is a bad deal? Zip in a minute. I'm going to bring him back to life. Just watch this. He didn't do that. He wept. Why? Because death is never a good thing. People, well, death is just natural. No, it's not. Death is not natural. There's nothing natural about it. It is evil. It is wrong. Ah, but in the face of Jesus, all things work together for good. And he turned around to that tomb, and I've been right there on that little road where Lazarus' tomb was in Jerusalem. And he says, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus erupted out of the grave alive. You see, all things in the economy of God, in the eternity of God, work together for good, to love him and those who are called according to his purpose. Because we are Christians, bad ultimately will turn out to be good, though we may not see it next week, or next year, or the next decade, but that's the promise that God gives to us 
as his children. That is so magnificent for you and I to know and claim. And this begins us, gets us on the road of understanding if God is for us, we're going to have that. Romans 8, 28 helps us to understand this. And then you see that word purpose. Open your Bibles, Romans chapter 8. I've just about worn out three or four Bibles with Romans 8. You don't see the pages. I can hardly read the scripture for the notes I put in the margins. Romans 8, 28. Now we're ready, for we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Purpose. We're going to begin to understand life. I wonder how many people are walking this earth, and you ask them the question, who are you? Well, I'm, I'm a carpenter, I'm this. No, no, no. Who are you? Big question, isn't it? Can you go through life not having a real valid answer? To Who are you? What about the next one? Where did you come from? Huh. Oh, why are you here? That's purpose. And where are you going? Big questions Paul deals with right here as we walk through Romans chapter 8. That's doctrine. No, that's basic fundamental belief upon which we build our lives and make our lives glorious for him. Purpose. He said, if we are living according to his purpose, what is his purpose? And I'm going to jump down here and get ahead. We go to back and pick up this verse. Look at verse 29. We're going to talk about predestination, but he's, in verse 29 he says, he also predestined us to become, get this, conform to the image of his son. The word conform there, the root is metamorphosis. What, what happens in metamorphosis? Here's a, uh, what is it over here? Here's a chrysalis, but over here you have a, an animal, a bug. Man, what is this? This is just an ugly kind of ugly, ugly, ugly bug. It goes into a chrysalis and it comes out a beautiful, beautiful butterfly. Metamorphosis, a miracle, a caterpillar, ugly, ugly, ugly bug ends up by dying in the chrysalis and becomes a butterfly. That is metamorphosis. And this is the word conform. Our purpose is we go through this metamorphosis and it says that become conformed to the image of his son the image of his son. We were all born image of God, right? Every human being has something of the stigmata, the image of God in their life. But now we are through a metamorphosis when we come to faith in Jesus Christ and give him our life and give him control of our life. We then are conformed to the image of his son. And that image of God by which we all have is enhanced because now we are having the stamp of Jesus on your life and my life. Many, many years, I was always turned off when people said, you're supposed to be like Jesus. Man, that's like telling me to climb Mount Sinai barefooted and naked. I mean, you just can't do it. I mean, that, that's so silly. To, I want you to be like Jesus. But this is what he's saying through a metamorphosis from my sinful life, through a metamorphosis, I am conformed and I become more and more like the image of that whom I have turned my life over to. See, and this is the firstborn among the brethren. I have females once in a while saying, why is the, the Bible so masculine? You know, why is it always the eldest son who gets the inheritance? Why is it the Firstborn. Let me tell you something. The Bible is revolutionary in all the so called gender arguments in which we find ourselves enmeshed in today. It is revolutionary. They're not Jew or Gentile, male or female, bond or free. 
There's already a body from this background of this race. We are all one in Jesus Christ. And the firstborn, Paul, amazingly, contradicts the whole understanding of society in the first century. What was that understanding? That understanding was when a father died, half the inheritance would be given to the eldest son and the daughters and the other sons were second-class citizens, particularly the females. But what does Paul say? Paul says when we're in Christ, this metamorphosis takes place and we're conformed to the image of the son as of the firstborn and then male and female and all of us become under the category of being firstborn. We all get the inheritance and we've already seen the inheritance also is a, is a part of the inheritance of Jesus Christ himself. So he blows away all the supposedly masculinity of the Bible. We're all firstborn, we all are inherited. We're all in Christ. We're all in the family of God, and there's absolute equality there. So let's look at this. This is our purpose. Don't get lost. This is our purpose, being conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn of many brethren. Now, we're going to look at what God did. Five things. Read any commentary, and they'll talk about five chains of truth. It tells us what God has done for all of us. And here we get into heavy theological water. First of all, look at what he says, the first link in that chain. He says, for those whom he foreknew, he foreknew. You foreknow something, you know it in advance. Is that not right? You foreknow, you for, he foreknew, you know in advance. And here is the theological dilemma of the ages, and I'm not going to solve it this morning. There's one view you can find in the Bible that is taught that if you are elected by God, bang, that's how you get salvation. If you haven't been elected by God, you do not get salvation. Salvation comes by the choice of God in every life. There's another view in the Bible that says, oh no, whosoever will may come to God and come to Christ. So here's the, here's the challenge we have. Is your salvation and my salvation based on by being elected by God or is your salvation and my salvation based upon free will, the choice that we've made? So there is the horns of the dilemma. The sovereignty of God is violated if we get there by free will, and the free will is violated if we get there only by the plan and the sovereignty of God. You got it. But let me show you a simple way to understand this. And let me to show you something that I've talked about for years. When we go to heaven, if that's the pearly gate, say, don't be, look very pearly to me. <laughs> when we go to heaven and wait, wait to go into heaven because we've been through this metamorphosis, over the gates of heaven, it'll say, whosoever will, let him come. God's will love the world. We, 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 our own free will. We're convicted of sin. We're broken. We know we're no way out. We've messed up so bad. We confess our sin. We turn from our sin. We receive Jesus Christ. I did that by my free will. And the front gate of heaven will say, whosoever will, God loves the world, you come to Christ. Now, we get on the inside of heaven, we're going to see something else. Chosen, elected from the foundation of the world. Both of those are biblical truths. How can that be? Free will, we chose Christ. We get inside, we see we were elected to be in the family of God before time began. And we see the word there, we have been foreknown by God. It means that God knows the choices we're going to make, and God knows ahead of time he is omniscient, Certainly, he would know the choices we're going to make. That's simply what this is saying. 
So you're talking about with election, you're talking about the Armenians, free will, the Calvinists, you've been elected by God. It's like arguing about the chicken and the egg, which came first. I don't know. Nobody knows. It doesn't matter. The important thing is that we're in Christ, we're in Christ, and that's the whole truth about it. And he foreknew that we would be in Christ. So what has God done about our salvation? Remember where we are. We're discovering our purpose. What's he done? And these, these five chains of truth that tells us what God has done, he has foreknown us. He has known us before we receive life in this world. He knew this because he is omniscient. Not only have we been foreknown, but also we have, look at the next phrase, we know it, we have been predestined. Predestined. Pre also means before. And destined has to do with destination. We know that we have come to Christ, and he knew that. It was pre-known, known to him. And now we know he knew our ultimate destination. He knew we'd have free will, and also we've been choice. Let me tell you what I do. I keep nominating people, and they keep getting elected. That's all I know. I nominate them, I share Christ, and God keeps electing them. I think that's how it works practically in evangelism and practically in coming into a new life. And we have been predestined in the sense God knows, as he's omniscient, what our destination is going to be. Not a perfect illustration. Let's say you were in New York, and you were setting sail on a ship that was destined to go to London. Now, you get on board that ship, and I'm not a sailor, and I don't like cruises for a lot of reasons. I don't like to spend about three or four days like this. <laughs> but that's just my problem. <laughs> and you'll say, take a shot. Take a I know. Uh -uh, uh -uh, uh -uh. Anyway, but they tell me on this cruise, it's, it's luxury living. I mean, I tell you, you can play games. You can be entertained. Or you can have magic shows. You have great food. All of that is wonderful. Now, if you set sail on this ship from New York to London, you can do a lot of things. You make a lot of choices on those big ships, don't you? How many of you have been on a cruise? Lift your hand. You have my sympathy. Anyway, <laughs> but, but you have a lot of choices on that cruise. They tell me, man, all kinds of places, different places to eat, different things. You make all of these choices, and that's free will. But I'll tell you, where is that ship going to end up? London. So I think that helps us understand we have predestined, and in our predestination, we make a lot of choices. And by the way, we make bad choices. Christians make bad choices. Sometimes we're fools. We're foolish, right? Sometimes we're filled with ego and pride. That's right. Now, God's going to have a tough time taking all those departures from his way and turning out them to be good. But he somehow even can do that. But you see, we're predestined in the sense we know our destination, London, our destination is heaven, our destination is these areas of life. But in the meantime, we have free will on this earth. We make decisions day by day by day. And what's the next thing? Two things. We've been pre-known. We've been predestined. Look at the next one in your Bible. It says we have been called. How important. Those he predestined, he also called. Call. There are two kinds of call that God places on us. The first call is a general call. Come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, I will give you rest. That's a general call to follow Christ. We, we have a, a big call to follow Christ. And that's a general thing. That's the whole area, I think, of, of natural faith. We look at the world, we see it was created by God, and God sends out a general call to us to come to him, to believe in him, and that's a general, broad call that he gives to anybody and everybody. It's a general call, but then there is a specific call. The theologians call it an, an 
effervescent call or an efficient call, a personal call. Now, that's difference. The general call says, whosoever will, let him come. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, whoever believes in him will not pay it ever. That's general calls he gives us. But the specific call comes is when we receive him. The general call is an external thing. The specific call becomes a personal, internal thing. See the difference? There's a general call to come to Christ. There's a whole thing. I'm a Christian. I've accepted the general call. You know, I, I've joined the church. I've been through all the rituals, and, and I'm sort of here and there and yawn in church, but somehow it hasn't become personal and specific. It doesn't determine how I think, the decisions I make, how my life operates. We're talking about the modus operandi of God. That's what this is. We're seeing how we are saved, and we're seeing how we can come to the idea that all things work together for good to those who love the Lord, those who are the called according to his purpose, and we've seen what his purpose is. We're to conform to the image of his son day by day. By the way, that's sanctification. That's sanctification, which isn't men mentioned here, but it's implied. And then we have this general call, and then we have this very specific call upon our lives, very personal, intimate call. And that is when salvation becomes fabulous, genuine. It's verified. But we look at the external. There's a guy who owned a business I read about, a large, large business. In fact, it was a corporation. And he was trying to hire somebody who'd be the new CEO. And, and, and the guy who owned the corporation was born without ears. And so the guy who was interviewing to be his new CEO, he asked him general questions. And, and the owner began to tell the story of his life, how God had blessed him, how he'd worked, and how he'd started at the bottom. It was one of those Horatio Alger stories. Beautiful, beautiful story. And when the guy got through interviewing, he asked the guy who was interviewing to be CEO, he said, do you see anything unusual about me? He said, yes, you don't have ears. He said, well, that's like everybody else. You just look at the external. I've told you about my life. You didn't even mention it. Man, man, get out of here. You can't work for me. Next guy came in. Same kind of thing, same kind of interview. And he got through it. He told him about his life, the owner of the corporation, the company. He told him about his life. Very impressive. And he got through the interview. He said, do you see anything unusual about me? He said, yes. You don't have ears. He said, you're like everybody else. You look at the external. I've told you about the internal part of my life. You weren't even interested in that. Get out of here. You can't get this job. So as this guy was walking out, somebody else was waiting to be interviewed. The guy who went over to him and said, I'll tell you something. You want this job? Don't mention anything about the fact he doesn't have ears. He said, you won't get the job. So the guy goes in, same kind of interview. The owner began to tell him his life story. And when he got through, he looked at him. He said, do you see anything unusual about me? He said, well, I noticed you wear a contact lens. He said, well, how did you know that? He said, you certainly couldn't wear glasses. <laughs> <laughs> so we have the same tendencies, you and I. We look at the external. We think that's important. We have a general understanding of God and Christ and church. We don't have that personal, intimate understanding of things that last forever. That is that specific call that we respond to when we're men and women and young people in Jesus Christ. If God be for us, pretty good choir. Y'all have had more rehearsal than the rest of us. If God be for us, Absolutely. And we're discovering this by these five great chains, what God has done. Remember what they are. He has foreknown us. He has predestined us. He has called us with a general call and then with a specific personal efficacious call to us. And then something else he's done. Look at the next of these five words he says. And whom he called, he also justified. 
Justified, justification. Know anything about that? Read in Romans chapter one through four, it's all about justification. We're saved by faith, not by works. And therefore we are justified before God. What does it mean to be justified? It means God is our judge. He looks at you and me who are in Christ. He sees the righteousness of Christ. We've made a great deal. We've given Jesus Christ our old life and he's given us his new life. We've given him our unrighteousness and he has infused with you and me his righteousness. Therefore, when God looks on you and me, he sees perfection. We've been justified and we know there's no condemnation. That's the last phrase here. No condemnation in Christ Jesus because the price has already been paid for your sin and my sin and therefore we are justified by faith. But faith isn't the big thing. We have the idea, if I had bigger faith or smaller faith, I need more faith. No, faith is sort of faith. I don't know if it's quantitative there. Uh, I remember reading about a Hindu mystic named Rio. And Rio was a mystical guy, lived in Bombay, and everybody looked, at to, looked up to him for his piosity. And he announced to all the people, on Thursday morning at 7 a.m., I'm going to walk on water. Whew. That drew a crowd. Man, they gathered around that big pool there. They said, Rio is going to walk on water, 7 a.m. People gather all around. And he did the usual gestations and looked up to heaven. And he walked out and stepped in the water. And boom, right down to the bottom he went. He came up stuttering and fluttering and climbed out of the water. He was angry. He said, somebody didn't have faith. That's the way it works, isn't it? A lot of people say, boy, if you had enough faith. No, faith is not the question. We have faith. God has given us faith, and he knows exactly how we can use that faith or not use that faith. This goes back to the election, this goes back to the Calvinists and back to the Armenians. He's given us faith by our free will. We can use that faith or not do that faith. If we use that faith, we are safe. We are right with God. That's the word. And therefore, we are justified. And sanctification is built in this, by the way. Because we're justified, we enjoy growing up in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then finally, we are glorified. Look at this last word. He also glorified us. Glorified. Remember the word glory means weight. It means there will come a day when you and I will be heavyweights. We'll waste something with God. We'll waste something with heaven. And that glorification begins now. And it's interesting, in the tense of these words, glorified is Present tense. They always, it's present tense. In other words, in a sense, we're already being glorified as we have gone through the metamorphosis and we are being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. There's a touch of glory in us now. So we have these five chains tells us what God has done so that we can know that we're saved, that we're no in his family, and God has done all of this for us. There's those five fabulous things, and then we come to that tremendous verse that we already claim, remember? Right up front and just a few seconds ago. What a world we live in. Ukraine, it's in the headlines, it's in our hearts. We as a church family, we've already sent things over there. We're getting a whole carload ready to send. We've already sent a good bit of money to missionaries, to those we know every penny will be handled as God would have it to be handled there in Poland and in Ukraine. We as a church family have already done that. We don't talk about those things. We just do them. There's enough talking that needs to be some living and doing, and that's our church family. But there in Eve, in the capital city there, is all over the internet. There's a young man named Igor who 
had a wife and two children. One was two and the other was five, two little girls. He was a Christian. He'd had a Christian ministry even over on radio and television there in the Ukraine. But he said a few days ago, he was in a bunker, fearful, upset, crying. He said, I never thought of myself as a coward, but he said, I was. He said, I wasn't ready to fight. I was just trying to cover my wife and my kids, and I was hunkered up there, and he, he said, I was just a nervous wreck. And he said, I, I, I didn't know what to do. I was embarrassed. But he said, one morning I got up, and God told me to read a psalm. And he said, I looked over at Psalm 91, and this was a psalm in which D David was surrounded. Everybody was trying to kill him and his group. This is a psalm that he wrote, and this young man, just a few weeks ago, that Ukraine, he said, I read this psalm. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. And I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For it is he who delivers you from the snare of the trapper and from the deadly pestilence. And he will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you may seek refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a bulwark. You will not be afraid of the terror by night or if the arrow that flies by day or the pestilence that stalks in, that stalks in darkness or of the destruction that lays waste at noon. A thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not approach you. You will only look on with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked for you have made the Lord my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. No evil will befall you, nor will any plague come near your tent, for he will give his angels charge concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will bear you up with their hands that you do not strike your foot against the stone, and you will tread upon the lion and the cobra and the young lion and the serpent you will trample down. Because he has loved me, therefore I will deliver him, and I will set him securely on high, because he has known my name. He will call upon me, and I will answer him, and I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him, and with a long life I will satisfy him and let him see my salvation. This young man said, I read that prayer. He said, suddenly, I wasn't worried about a thing in the world. And he said, I put that on the internet. And he said, to my amazement, I asked other people simply to pray that prayer, read that psalm. And he said, over 20 young people from 16 to 20 years of age responded to him. And he said he dialogued with them, and they were hungry, not just to be spared in the crisis in Ukraine. He said they were hungry for life, for meaning, for purpose. And he said over half of them came to faith in Jesus Christ. And he said, then I told them to broadcast this in their area of responsibility. And he said, before I knew it, he said literally, Thousands of people, not only in Ukraine, around the world, have read this passage and come to faith in Jesus Christ. All things work together for good to those who love the Lord and those who are called according to his purpose. Micro, whew, tough. But Christians in God's hands, macro, whew, it will be and is magnificent. If God be for us, who can be against us? Nobody. 
Our Heavenly Father, these are big, humongous, gigantic, overwhelming promises. True truth. And Father, we rejoice in the confidence we have in our salvation, in our walk with Jesus Christ. And may we quicken our pace. May we take things to a new level as we seek to be light in a darkened world. Father, we know that Jesus came to the world. He was the light of the world, but so many rejected the light. But Lord, we're so thankful that though people in that day killed the lighthouse, who was Jesus, may we be light bearers of Christ, carrying our crosses, knowing that whatever happens and comes our way, that you're working through it all for your glory and for our pleasure forever. We thank you for that blessed, blessed assurance.